Hello, welcome everyone. It's so nice to have you here today for our first IHC Academy training featuring Children's Specialized Hospital. My name is Rebecca Martin, and I'm a graduate assistant with the grant facilitation team at the Edward J. Blaustein School of Policy and Planning at Rutgers. And um, we're working to coordinate these New Jersey Inclusive Healthy Communities training series and the um, IHC Academy training. So I'm joined today by my colleague, Karen Alexander, who graciously agreed to assist me with the facilitation of this meeting. We're very excited to have you here, and um, I have a few housekeeping notes before we start the presentation. I'd like to make you all aware that we'll be recording today's presentation and making it publicly available. If you would benefit from having access to the presentation slides and handouts, um, you can download them from a link that I'm going to be providing you uh, in the chat in a few moments. You can feel free to add any questions that come up in the chat and or you can hold them to the end either way, but we're going to have a question and answer period at the end. Um, we'll be um, given the interest in today's training. We'd really like to add you to our list to receive future um, opportunities for free trainings. If you would like to opt out of that list, then you can either chat me um, through Zoom or I can also give you my email address in a few moments and you can send me an email privately if you'd like to opt out. And then um, before we begin, I'd like to take a moment to express our deep appreciation to Perry Neron and her team at the New Jersey Division of Disability Services for making this training series and also the IHC grant program possible. And um, now without further ado, I will turn it over to Adrian Robertiello and Dr. Jill Harris talking about their Living Safely project at Children's Specialized Hospital. Okay, um, well, uh, thank you, Rebecca. My name is Jill Harris, and I uh, would like to describe myself. I'm a white a woman, older, with gray hair, and wearing a um, black and white sweater. Um, at Children's Specialized Hospital, my title is Associate Vice President for the Research Program, and I also coordinate autism services. And just a very quick blurb about Children's Specialized, um, we're the, the um, largest provider of um, special of care to uh, children with special health needs, I think in the country, uh, we're a very large uh, provider of services in this region and we have 15 locations throughout New Jersey. We were super, super proud to be a recipient in the, um, the cohort, the first cohort of the Inclusive Healthy Communities Grant. We wanna tell you um, about that grant. I also just want to say that I'm also a parent of an uh, adult son with autism and the sister of, um, an adult with chronic illness. And it's my uh, huge pleasure and joy to introduce my friend and colleague, Adrian Robertiello. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Adrian, and I am a middle aged, white, brown haired woman with blue glasses. Um, I have a um, black and brown shirt on and behind me are lots of resources that um, I need to start distributing out to many people. So you'll see a lot of uh, uh, interesting background on my end. Um, I am a, a person who identifies with as a uh, with a disability. I also have an adult son with autism and multiple disabilities. Um, and um, my position here at Children's Specialized is special health care educator, where I primarily work to uh, develop um, education and uh, and resources for people with disabilities and their families focused on inclusion. A lot of the work that we do is on safety. Um, and so I'm, we're really proud today to talk about the work that we've done through the state, through the Living Safely program. Um, I, I It was one of the best grants that I've ever worked with, and I know Jill would agree with that, and we can't wait to share that with you. Jill, do you want to start? Or am I starting? I'm starting. I'm starting. <laughs> okay, so living safely with disabilities and special health needs. Uh, that is the name uh, that we, um, we, and I'm going to include um, all of our uh, core partners that we'll talk about in a moment, uh, including people with disabilities, uh, they were involved from the very beginning of our grant, even in the grant proposal, <clears throat> excuse me, and they helped de um, develop the name, the branding, everything. So I really want to emphasize that we involve people with disabilities from the very beginning of our grant, and um, we're going to talk through this um, webinar today about how important that is. 
Um, we know that, and this is where um, our the foundation of our grant uh, came from, that dis uh, disabled people are a large and growing population that are often unprepared for situations that put safety at risk or cause injury. Um, service providers, including emergency responders, are often inadequately trained to identify, interact with, and address safety concerns of people with disabilities. I do want to acknowledge that throughout um, today's webinar, and in fact, in all the work that we've done, uh, we use um, both disabled people and people with disabilities interchangeably, the identity first and the people first. Um, we do that purposely so that we can respect people's choice and how they would like to be identified. So it's really something I'd like to emphasize in a lot of the work that we have done. Um, and overall, the grant and the work that we've done, the intent of the whole project was to set the groundwork for equity and in innovation, right? We want to make sure that what we're doing now and in the future includes people with disabilities because safety is a fundamental human right. I also want to, uh, you may have heard safety, I'm um, sorry, health literacy. So health literacy um, is just help making sure that patients understand what the doctors are telling them. And we thought it was important that we emphasize safety literacy. And that's the degree to which individuals have the capacity to obtain, process, and understand basic safety information, services, and supports to live safely, prevent hazards, prepare for emergencies, and respond to emergent situations. Every person has the right to be safe. And so we've come to determine, and, and Jill's going to talk about that in a moment, how many people with, um, in our in our conversations with people with disabilities really uh, signs that, that they see um, as they're going by or safety resources that they have are not necessarily relevant to them, understandable to them, and accessible for them. So that's really the construct of where we started with this grant. And this is kind of the foundation for all the, the work that we have done. It's with, by, and for. So with people with disabilities, by them and for them. And that was really what we kept through the beginning all the way through the end of our grant and beyond. We're still um, really making sure that that is kind of the essence of, of really what we do. Um, our core partners, uh, which were people that were subject matter experts. Um, they were people uh, obviously with disabilities. There are thought leaders that we've included within our um, our project. They were involved through every month. We had a meeting with our core partners through the beginning to the end, including people with disabilities in every aspect of our grant. And this is kind of where, so now I want to kind of get casual with Jill. So this is kind of the process by which um, we established uh, how our whole grant went through the whole uh, cohort one process. So it started with our core partners and um, bringing in people with disabilities and other safety stakeholders. Then we conducted this safety survey, which we'll talk about in a moment. Then we brought in a lot in, of people. We talked to people nationwide and we built relationships. Then came COVID. Uh, we then conducted an inclusion and in innovation summit. And we established then this very huge online center for safety, which was a very long process to complete. And we'd like to share that process with you today. Jill? Okay, let's go on to the next slide. So um, really in... One of the reasons why we were excited to talk to you guys is that we really want to have this opportunity to share our experiences and we want to emphasize some of the challenges that we had and some of our lessons learned because hopefully you can um, benefit from that. And uh, just to a little advanced organizer, the main theme of this <laughs> is the uh, need to be resilient and uh, the importance of building relationships. So th with the safety survey, I don't think that we even said when we um, wrote the grant that we were going to do this safety survey, but we really early on thought this would be a great opportunity to, to really kind of uh, gather some baseline information about uh, what the experiences um, are of people with disabilities, of uh, the caregivers and parents of people with disabilities, of first responders, and of educators related to safety. You know, what are uh, what experiences do they have? 
uh, what are the areas where they see that there's greater need. <clears throat> and, um, and so while we had the input from our core partners and our, our, our team, we thought it was really important to go beyond um, that group. So um, next slide. So we sent out, we created the survey and again, it was done in partnership with uh, the core partners that included um, people with disabilities. And, um, and we took a lot of time on this. And what we wanted to do is we had a different version, as I said, for these different groups, but we wanted to distribute it as widely as we possibly could. And so, uh, you know, every uh, group and organization that we could think of, uh, social media and so forth, we uh, advertised the opportunity to participate in the survey so that we could gather the information and for those voices to be included. <clears throat> we ended up receiving 783 surveys and the surveys were available in English as well as Spanish. Um, again, there's lots of lessons learned. And if this was one of the things that you'll see as a recurring theme is that we had this, the, a plan for what we would do. And then we thought bigger, you know, we said, okay, this is what we want, wanted to do. But then is there a way to kind of expand this? Is there a way to kind of get um, not just, uh, you know, local input, but what about statewide? What about regional? What about national? Um, so that if this was our only task of the grant, we would have thought it would be very important to get this baseline survey, this national survey, and, uh, and really get the word out there about what the needs are. But this was just one little tiny portion of our grant. And like I said, it was kind of unplanned. So um, uh, what we found is that, uh, you know, in surveying people with disabilities, that almost all of them stated that they knew how to get help from firefighters, for example. But 18% of them said that they were uncomfortable. They knew how to do it, but they were uncomfortable about actually getting the help. Again, with the uh, police officers, 90% 90 knew how to get help from a police officer, but now you see the percentage go up about 28% felt that they were uncomfortable with actually getting that help. And uh, a very high percentage of uh, disabled people indicated that they had interacted with emergency responders often many times. So um, one of the questions we had in the survey was kind of open-ended. What advice would you have for emergency responders? And this is something that came up and it's a thread that, uh, about that we use throughout. So one of the recurring messages was uh, just because I'm upset doesn't make me a threat and don't assume that I could follow your directions. Um, <clears throat> it's okay to ask me questions, but I might not understand and I might not, uh, I might need it to be repeated. Um, with the er emergency responders who um, completed the survey, almost all of them indicated that they had, again, had interactions with people with disabilities. Um, most of them had multiple interactions with people with disabilities. One thing that was interesting is that uh, near a little over half of the emergency responders um, stated that they had a personal connection with the people with disabilities. So we're not sure how representative their responses might be. <clears throat> with the parents and caregivers, um, uh, they, it helped, they helped to identify areas that they thought uh, were important that um, that their family members needed more help with. And again, their message to emergency responders was to please have more care and patience, be understanding, seek more education about how to interact with disabled people and the importance of communicating clearly before acting. So um, the main, what we did with all of this information is we uh, wanted it to inform the content and the methods for delivering uh, safety education and also uh, to make sure that emergency responders uh, and all the safety education for people with disabilities and the training for emergency responders um, and make sure that this content was informed by the lived experience of people with disabilities, their family members and um, educators. I would like to add that, you, you know, as much as we had 783 surveys, we sent out thousands and thousands of them. So, you know, keep that in mind that as many as we, you know, we know the percentages are so usually so low. I think we did well with this, but we sent them out to organizations and disability groups, and and you know, so this was a very very large distribution, um, and we are we we are very happy with 783, but um, you know that does not you know pale in comparison to how many we sent out. Right, and the other thing just to point out is we try to do a, a lit review. There isn't a lot that's been done uh, in terms of safety surveys. And one of the things that we think is just so important, and I don't want to eat up all the time, but um, safety is, as Adrian said, it's a fundamental human right. And we really want to get everybody interested in this, um, researchers, tech developers, everybody, because there's nothing that really is 
kind of more crucial that if you're not safe and then nothing else really, you know, everything falls to the wayside if, if somebody's not safe. Um, so this slide is just to point out that how important and how much emphasis we put on re relationship development in this grant. <clears throat> Adrian spoke uh, earlier about um, how we uh, formed our, our core partners and uh, reached out right from the very beginning and conceptualizing this uh, project with people with disabilities. And this group grew. So one of, uh, while we had um, uh, uh, many people who were involved from the get-go with disabilities, it became apparent to us the importance of intersectionality. We needed more representation uh, from people um, uh, who were not white, uh, people who uh, were Latino, um, people from different backgrounds. And so the group expanded over the course of the grant as we were able to add additional partners um, who represented uh, you know, different experiences. Um, we went into this really with in, intentionally. So Adrian has done a lot of work prior to this grant as well in terms of safety um, education and safety training. So she had a lot of context. And well, we use these contexts to really expand and uh, in terms of the number of the subject matter experts that were involved in this. Um, you know, what happens is when you talk to one person, then it leads to, oh, let me introduce you to all of these other people. And so we had so many meetings, especially Adrian, uh, where it just really expanded the network uh, to people on a, a national level. Uh, we each were involved in, in different groups. Um, whether it's uh, LEND or AUCD, and found that uh, we were able to then bring in uh, people on a national level who uh, had interest and uh, experience in some aspects of safety. <clears throat> um, as Adrian said, we pulled in different uh, disability groups as well and Centers for Independent Living. Uh, we talked to researchers. One person would tell us about some research that was going on here versus there, so we pulled them in. Uh, we contacted people from CHOP, Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. We found out that they were doing <clears throat> research on um, with virtual reality and uh, helping people with autism prepare for interactions with emergency responders. We talked to the tech developer they were working with. So you could just see, and I'm sure you guys all have a similar experience in terms of how one thing could just broaden. and. I know Adrian and I had lots of conversations over the course of this grant is should we narrow it down? You know, I'm always one to say, oh, let's just talk about, you know, what we check this box. And she was, no, we have to think big. We have to use this opportunity to really expand the networks and get people talking to each other. Uh, so I think that that was super helpful and it continues to be super helpful in terms of not just the networking, but the dissemination of, uh, of the products of this grant. I, I can't emphasize it emphasize enough how important those relationships from the beginning and how they grew, grew and networked um, really were critical to this project and beyond. Um, and we'll talk about more that more in a moment. Okay, so one of the things that, again, that we knew right from the beginning from uh, in talking with our core partners was the importance of all the different aspects of safety. One of the aspects of safety that was really important was interactions between law enforcement and people with disabilities. I mean, us, you know that there's been several high profile, horrible uh, events that have happened, but <clears throat> we learned from our, our baseline safety survey that you know most people with disabilities had had some interactions. Sometimes it went well, sometimes it didn't go well. Um, this is, so I'm gonna talk about a little, a little bit about this, but I also wanna put a pin in it because this is important things in terms of lessons learned and resilience. So we had some, um, some relationships with uh, law enforcement and, uh, and had done some work in some of the different municipalities. But uh, what we quickly learned is that this topic was so much bigger than we anticipated. Um, uh, it was, it's really a very fraught topic. So some of the people with disabilities who we were reaching out to and some of the organizations uh, of um, disabled people said, we do not wanna to touch this topic at all uh, there's too much trauma history uh, behind it. We won't be in the same room, even the same virtual room with law enforcement. It's important, but count me out, um, which we weren't really expecting. And again, we were naive in many, many ways. And there were so many lessons learned from this. It took us a much longer time than we thought it would take actually getting our literal feet in the door uh, with some of the um, targeted uh, uh, municipalities, police departments, and fire departments. When we did finally have uh, get meetings face to face, uh, what we learned is that in each situation, the first the law enforcement first responders really wanted to know more about 
how to effectively interact and build relationships with people with disabilities in each of the departments. They had done some work, they had gotten some training, but there are so many competing priorities, if you will. And uh, one of the things, one of them asked us outright is, are you gonna be just like another grant who comes in, plops, does something, and then we never see you again when the funding ends. And uh, we said, oh no, that's not our intention. We don't wanna do that, we nah. don't wanna do that. But what ended up happening is to some extent, um, we nice. did give resources and we hope that um, they continue to be disseminated. But, um, you know, th there is a lesson learned that that's an issue. And I think that one thing is that, at least on this topic, you need to not just partner with, but have it maybe definitely co-led uh, by people in law enforcement. <clears throat> so one thing that I would like to add um, is that our core partners have kept on telling us and advocating that they're sick of being the grant. Right. Let's get a grant to help people with disabilities versus let's get disability supports in the core budgeting of the operations of whatever agency that is. Right. It should be equally and equitably um, people with disabilities involved in everything, um, accessibility in whether whether it's an education training um, services. Um, they're kind of sick of being the grant. And so that's where we felt a little challenged by our advocates saying that, you know, this is going to start and this is going to end and that's going to be it. And so, you know, we are very committed to continuing these conversations. We'll talk more a uh, bit about the coalition, but um, go ahead, John. Okay, um, so just to point out that we wrote the grant during COVID, uh, but when we wrote it, this was an 18 month grant and it was really hard to predict what was going to happen during the course of the 18 months in terms of if we could have events that were face to face, you know, we were hoping that we would, it ended up that we really couldn't, you know, just because of, uh, you know, COVID restrictions <clears throat> in this area. But, uh, you know, I think it's a mixed blessing. And one of the um, big activities of our project was to have a summit series um, where we were talking about uh, innovations and inclusion and what's needed in terms of safety um, training and safety education. And because it had to be virtual, there was advantages to that because we had people from all over the country who participated and had a virtual seat at the table with each other. And we're gonna talk more about that in a little bit. But if it had been in person and if we had really had that focus, yes, there's things, the advantages to meeting in person, but it would have been much, much narrower in terms of who was able to participate. And whether it's COVID, or anything else, I guess, I think Joel will agree, expect the unexpected, because you just never know what, you know, COVID popped up for this, but really anything could come in the middle of a grant or the work that you do. And again, that emphasis, emphasis on resilience, and you know, you may have to pivot some of your work, but really stay focused on the goal. So, um, you know, many things, for instance, you know, some of the things that we were challenged by with law enforcement and on other thing, other challenges that we had in accessibility, for instance, we were on our own website here at the hospital, which we came to find found out because we were doing some web based stuff that we weren't even accessible here and we're, we didn't expect that or some of our the, the portal. So whether we used go to meeting, we are using Zoom now. The, the portal that we used was not accessible. We did not even know until our advocates said to us, we're not even participating in these meetings because your meeting portal is not accessible. So all of these things we say when one door closes, we really had to kind of all of a sudden put our you know big girl pants on and say, what do we have to do? How do we need to solve that? So this is really a lesson for us in what what we're hearing back again directly from people with disabilities you don't know what you don't know and once you know you have a responsibility to do something about it so we you know we've had conversations here within our organization who were so receptive about oh my gosh we didn't realize that okay here we're going to help you in this way but that's that whole when you know you don't know what you know, the whole, you don't know what's going to be put in front of you. That, those things took us longer to do because of inaccessibility um, factors. So from the beginning, you really need to be thinking about accessibility issues and things that might come up throughout the course of the grant. <laughs> Excuse me. So um, in all of the work that we have done, and it really, we have to kind of credit ourselves that this was really a very complex grant. And if I were to do it all over again, 
well, I probably would do it all over again the same way, but it really was very um, complex and there was just a lot in it. There were so many parts of it that could have been a grant in and of itself. So we developed something called a project pipeline, which were a lot of the resources and, and we had resources and videos and all these other things that are part of the grant that we had to channel and figure out how to process. So we had review by our core advocates and our disability advocates who reviewed everything we did. How do we organize it? How do we maintain the formatting and the branding of it all? We had a whole process that we called Project Pipeline. And within that pipeline, we had our safety resources, our safety tools, community safety com conversations, and safety advocacy and information. Those are the categories of the work that we did and lots underneath. So uh, Jill mentioned that we had a summit. Summit. It was actually 11 sessions called the Inclusion in Innovation Summit. It was um, virtual. It was probably one of the most um, impactful experiences that I've ever had in my professional career. We had about 165 permit, um, participants nationwide. Every one of those 11 sessions were led co-led with a subject matter expert and a person with a disability. So each person, um, the co-leads really facilitated questions about these particular topics that you see on the screen right now. These topics were um, pre-identified as um, whether that came from the survey or from our disability advocates of being important safety issues. We invited nationwide group of advocates, first responders, subject matter experts, thought leaders. We had everybody on the table. And when they all came in each one of these topics, we didn't know how it was going to go. So lesson learned from the day before this happened, we said we could have two people or we could have a pool of people. And we were very, very happy with the amount of response that we received and the dialogue that happened within um, these these summit sessions. They were fully accessible, which again, because of COVID, they were virtual. So we had the ability to have nationwide participants who did not have to travel. We had people with disability um, that didn't have to worry about physical accessibility issues. We included in the summit completely made it accessible with live captioning, sign language interpretation. Um, so we really um, prepared for these summit sessions. Um, but what we I learned about it, what we received direct comment from the participants was, we need to do this more often. We're not talking with each other. Usually we have a presentation and you're being talked at. We like this, this format where we're sharing people with disabilities perspectives and um, you know the fire safety professionals and researchers all at the same time. That was to me, I think should be a factor in everything that we do and the decisions that we make so that they're fully inclusive and involve everybody's perspective. So I, I was very, um, I think this, this summit session, the 11 sessions were really um, very telling in not only the content, but in the format really, um, thought it was very um, impactful for all the work that we did. Um, so in that in the sessions, we talked about, as we talked about innovation, it was mostly about augmented and virtual reality and how currently safety, um, if we talk about safety education, we talk about kids learning stop, drop, and roll, or what happens when, um, you know, if you know, if you expose your password on your credit card, um, whatever it might be. Where we heard that all this kind of training and education is very generic, and it's um, mostly for people who are either physically abled or non-disabled in some way, so not very relevant to them. Fire safety, um, you know, um, police safety, all of those things are not necessarily relevant, accessible, or understandable for people with disabilities. So we said, okay, let's. How can we then? make new technology that might be more accessible and more relevant and more um, uh, that we can get data on actually and really be able to say, hey, are people learning how to be safe? So that's where the ARVR came in. Um, it really encourages safe ways to practice. We know many of people with disabilities, particularly intellectual disabilities or autism need opportunities to practice over and over. Um, 
it, it could help um, caregivers and emergency responders understand how to better interact and engage um, people with disabilities in safety and safety education. So um, we really were um, in the summit, we heard back with a lot of positive um, input relative to using augmented and virtual reality in safety education. Jill? Okay, so as um, Adrian said, we had 165 people participate, but guess what? None of them were the tech developers that we'd invited. And this was really very disappointing because, I mean, one of, we wanted them to be literally at the table, the virtual table, to help inform and to hear what the issues were that were being identified and how this could work. And uh, the fact that they didn't uh, attend, even though they'd been invited, again, you know, lesson learned, we probably could have done something different there. And it's not over till it's over because we still are sending this stuff to them. But um, so across the, the different topics, some of the same issues were identified, uh, regardless of if the, the uh, summit um, session was uh, geared towards uh, firefighting, fire issues, law enforcement, elopement wandering, or what have you. But so some of the repeated um, issues were, were that the safety education and resources that are out there might not be relevant, understandable, or accessible. They typically were not developed in partnership or with the input of people with disabilities. And uh, that even when there might be you no know, simulation, so let's say if there's um, you know, uh, some training and you're doing some role play or something like that, they often did not include people with disabilities or issues related to people with disabilities. It was just felt like, ah, oh, this is gonna be too much, it's too complex to try to do that. Um, that emergency responders and direct service res uh, providers, so it could be, um, you know, it doesn't have to be an emergency responder. They typically are not trained to recognize and address the safety needs of disabled people. And here's something that's important that when safety education is provided or safety training is conducted, there usually is not any, out, there aren't outcome measures or any um, studies that look to say, did this really make a difference? I mean, what you find time and time again is it's mostly like anecdotal data, data where people had testimonies about how going to this training really changed everything and here's what I did differently. And that's great, but it's not really um, something that you could then use to say, did this training make a difference? And so it's so important to build that outcome measurement in right from the get go. Um, also, there were limited opportunities to understand and pra uh, practice lessons in, in terms of how the um, lessons were being presented. And if you look at national databases related to safety, they tend to underreport what's going on for, for lots of different reasons. So that it's not as if that there's um, data that we could point to about the effectiveness of safety education or for people with disabilities or provider training for how to uh, better relate to people with disabilities. So some of the conclusions <clears throat> from the summit series, those were the issues. So some of the conclusions and recommendations were that um, it's most, it's really crucial to involve people with disabilities at all phases of the safety education and professional training. Much like our grant was kind of like a parallel process about involving people with disabilities and thinking, well, what do we wanna do and writing the grant and all this. The same thing has to happen with, when you're uh, creating education and professional trainings, training. Um, that the emergency planners we learned wanted to work with disabled people, but didn't always know how to best do that. Um, as Adrian said, we were asking, well, what about augmented reality and virtual reality? And <clears throat> the, um, the conclusion seems to be is that you can't, it can't replace the human interaction and in safety education and training. There still needs to be some, of, some human interaction, but to incorporate it as part of the safety education and training really has a lot of pro uh, promise because you could customize the situation. So like a lot of the... Um, Several of our disabled participants said that if they had a trauma history, that you could build things into the ARVR to allow for that. Maybe a different scenario, maybe allowing the person to exit out of there, uh, maybe ways of, um, of being able to uh, detect live in real time if the person's heart rate was starting to speed up or what have you. There's so many different ways to customize. You could customize the situation to reflect <clears throat> the race and ethnicity or the setting. Uh, of the safety situation. But the primary barrier is the cost and time needed to create this AR VR and the importance of making sure that, um, that the, uh, once it's created and in partnership with people with disabilities, that it's equally accessible <clears throat> for all. Uh, 
and that once it's developed, we think it, it sounds the feedback that we got is that it would be cost effective, as I said, customizable and highly impactful. <clears throat> so we took all of this and uh, we created a, a white paper um, which outlines the best practices for inclusive safety education and training through emerging technology. And the intention of this white paper is really to have a call to action for collaboration in lots of different areas. So one of the areas is research, really an opportunity to collaborate here to measure the utility of safety education and safety training, to measure the accessibility of this education and training, to measure uh, how well it actually generalizes uh, from the training environment to the real life situation, and does it end up in reducing injuries? So um, the that inclusion um, and innovation um, webinar web, uh, white paper was actually one portion of the whole online center for safety. So as I mentioned, we have lots lots of components of that. The link is right there, and so I'm going to go through this quickly because I want to make sure we have enough time for questions at the end. Um, but the components of uh, living safely are safety resources, uh, safety tools, community safety conversations, and safety advocacy and information. Um, in safety resources, we have multiple topics. In the course of our grant, we were able to identify nine different categories. There were so many others that we wanted to get to, and this involved so many different, it, it was so complex because every single resources that resource that we um, provided, we did in multiple formats. For instance, we um, provide in plain language and text only, um, audio only, a picture story, a narrated, narrated picture story, and text with images. So every single resource that's on this online center for safety is in all of these formats, as well as in English and Spanish. So that pipeline um, project pipeline was really to track all of these different resources that we did. Uh, so in safety tools, we have um, things that hopefully that people with disabilities and their caregivers could use. Um, you could see one is on elopement and wandering. There may be identification or information about myself. Um, so we have multiple tools that are in uh, the online center for safety. We also have community safety conversations. And so these are, um, I guess, templates, if you want to call that, to help guide discussions between emergency responders and local residents. So we have found that most times it's after the emergency happens. You know, the, you know, we have a storm that's in place or after the storm has happened, now what? How are we helping people with disabilities through that? So we wanna encourage those conversations within uh, communities to happen before an emergency. So the, we provide these tools for emergency responders and individuals with disabilities to have those conversations. And that's what we call community safety conversations. And lastly, we have um, a section called safety advocacy and information. Um, we have in that uh, first something called the Coalition for Living Safely with Disabilities and Special Health Needs. So it's a LinkedIn um, uh, uh, group, which we invite organizations, agencies, emergency responders, academics, others, anybody who wants to talk about disability and safety especially our disabled advocates to be part of this conversation and continue, like we said, after the grant to make sure this conversation continues and the work continues, hopefully in much more collaboration versus lots of things that are happening in silos as they are now. Um, I wanna share with you one of the um, multiple, um, we did about nine public service announcements. Um, we thought it was important for people with disabilities to express how they felt, um, what, what important safety issues were important to them. We also wanted to provide some serv public service announcements that exposed people with disabilities to services that were available to them, such as um, in New Jersey, there's the New Jersey uh, NJ Pies or New Jersey Register Ready. We wanted to make sure they were aware of those um, services. So we have about nine public service announcements. And this one here was done um, with the clients from Opportunity Project, which is a program that supports adults with uh, traumatic brain injury. They share tips about 
safety and information that they want other people uh, with disabilities to know about, about the they want to share with the community and with emergency responders. So this is just a small snippet of that. Um, of that. Uh, what do you want first responders to know about people with disabilities? Some of them just don't respect you whatsoever, no matter what you do. I think they would be more understanding that you're disabled, but I'm disabled, a woman, and my some of a factor. I would tell him to use simple language for anybody who's disabled, usually in a wheelchair. Been down to my level, so I don't have to look up all the time. Don't talk to me like a mud child. I think they just know that you'll be a little bit slower than the next guy. And you may not maybe some certain things, but you really couldn't help yourself. Um, but they may some know, they some, like you said, they probably should concern with you before people that have both in capacity. Well, I'm not on. <laughs> I think that's the respect for the one, like you said, the response time. And sometimes it, it um, takes us even longer to think things out. So I was like, dude, look at my hands. I'm, 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 on my, I'm not going to point this one. I'll say that. But the, the respect for the police officer, that's not what you have to uh, you know, me, my response time down is great. I had two guys back a long time ago, and it still affects me very dearly. And I, 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 um, I'm doing my best, officer. And what do you think I should do? Let them know that you're, you're not you're not going to cause any trouble at all. And just ask ask if you can help you and um and tell a little bit of your history and say what happened to you in in no circumstances. That's all. You, know, you have to repeat yourself some of the questions because I got pulled over for a police vehicle for going too too fast and still going. He said, "Are you going? You know, five thousand on the street." I'm sorry, officer. Awesome. He, he, he saw out a conversion panel and tried to put your hand again. What happened to him? Someone happened to him. He said, Well, okay, just be very careful and be conscious of it. So every time I go through, hey, I'm make sure I go well below the screen. But he basically consciously have a setback, I think. That's very important for us. Jill? Um, so uh, we really encourage you to, uh, Rebecca put the link in the chat uh, for this, for our whole online safety hub. And so we really encourage you to poke around there and, and uh, watch the PSAs or, or download any of this. And I think it's, um, Adrian said, everything's in English as well as Spanish. So one of the things here, uh, recognizing that we, it's important to disseminate the, uh, the work of this and to get uh, the information out into the hands of people who could really make things happen is that we took, uh, we tried to distill a lot of the information that we learned and uh, put it into short, graphically interesting kind of information sheets, again, geared to the audience uh, who can put this into action. Um, so the goal in, in this whole thing with the grant is not just to have a checkbox, okay, we did it, this was a time frame that we said we'd do it, but how do we really uh, disseminate and get the word out there? So for example, um, uh, some of uh, these things are just in like one page graphic form and it could be geared to municipalities uh, so that, uh, with guidance about how they can have these community safety um, uh, conversations with people and include people with disabilities from their communities and safety planning and so forth. Uh, for this, for, for me, for the guidance documents was very important um, that I didn't feel like I was um, dropping the ball on, uh, you know, after the grant was over, we weren't done and it was finished. It was really, for me, our, our core partners and our team's way of saying, this is what we have learned and this is what we want to share and this is what we really recommend being done. So this is kind of what we have uh, called our, our guidance documents is a way to, uh, to hopefully carry that grant further and have others involved um, so that they have the information that we have captured within the, the context of our entire grant. And just to reiterate again that uh, this was informed by some of the people who uh, you know were part of the audience, so that it's not just okay. Well, ugh, we have this big plop. You're at uh, you know it's that uh, that they were also having the virtual seat at the table and informing us. So we just wanted to say thank you again so much. 
um, to the Division of Disability Services, New Jersey Department of Human Services. It was really a joy to work um, uh, with the group and, and shout out to, um, to Perry Neron and uh, Karen Alexander, who was our, our uh, one of our champion contacts. Definitely champions. Uh, <laughs> so this is uh, contact information for Adrian and me, and we would really love to open it up for uh, questions and, and comments and see what, what you all think. 